Oh my goodness, I just started and already a glitch. I'm hoping that's not a sign of things to come, but I am excited to be talking to you guys today. And the focus is atrial rhythms. Now we covered most of this in class, but I know you prefer to have a uh, video recording as well. So I'm gonna start right at the beginning of atrial rhythms here. We're gonna move our way through from some very simil, uh, simple, anomalous, single beat um, uh, differences that we see, all the way up through those common things that you've heard about uh, throughout your program, atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation. So um, the next, I think it'll take us about 40 minutes, we'll see, maybe half an hour, will be a ride through um, atrial rhythms and what we see as normal and what we see as abnormal. Okay, Let's see if I can move that down. Okay, you remember this beautiful picture, and I don't usually go through all of those different chambers and things. You know my diagram I draw on the board, those two beautiful little atria, the two big ventricles. You see the muscle of those ventricles is uh, large and well-developed, in particular that left ventricular muscle that is the powerhouse of pumping. The atria, you'll see that that muscle layer is so much smaller, right? So they're very, what we call them as thin wall. That thin wall chambers, and they have low pressure. And what that means is that there's that passive filling that comes from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. So do you see on that uh, right um, atria, atrium, the inferior vena cava dumps into there and the superior vena cava dumps into there. And uh, in both cases, we see that, that that is continuously happening. We have that passive filling. So the blood just passively goes from the atria right into the ventricle. So it's not closed off. It doesn't wait until it's full uh, to empty the way the ventricle does. It is uh, passively filling. But the important thing that we really pay attention to is about, that's only for accounting for about 70% of that ventricular blood flow. So about 70% of that uh, of the blood flows directly from the atria into the ventricles. But with that atrial contraction, we get that additional 30% added filling to the ventricles. So when we have a different kind of rhythms later in this lecture, where we don't have that good atrial contraction, we're losing that 30%. It counts for typically about 30% of our cardiac output. And that's, we're losing what we call as the atrial kick that kick as we empty that um, atria very effectively and all of that blood moves into the ventricle and then waits for the ventricle to fill at which point it is able to eject. Okay, so um, what do we know? Remember the P waves on your uh, tracing, those P waves, that very first up, typically upward deflection, uh, reflects that uh, depolarization of the atria. And it takes a little bit of time, right? There's that depolarization starts uh, in a normal sinus rhythm. Uh, it starts in the SA node. In other kinds of atrial rhythms, it start, can start somewhere else in the atria and it moves down through those different pathways to the AV node, uh, gather, stops there, gathers up steam, and then moves through the ventricles in the best of all cases. Now that's not always the best of all cases. In some cases, rather than uh, seeing that, that um, those SA node cells, which have this sort of innate automaticity, they want to be the leader, and it is most effective for our heart function if they are the leader. Sometimes things can impact whether that's the case. So for example, um, uh, we can have medications on board, or uh, some kind of substances, so illicit substances, some kind of drugs and other things that impact the automaticity, the um, innate capacity and tendency for the rest of our cardiac cells, those um, uh, nerve cells within our heart to um, initiate their own electrical impulse. And so it's really important that we pay attention to what might be the cause if we're seeing that sort of automaticity uh, um, that tells us that <coughs> impulses are starting at different points, not just routinely in that SA node. So we see that sometimes there's what's called triggered activity, certain uh, phenomena, external phenomena can lead to um, that, uh, those anomalous beats. And there's also, and I'm not gonna get too deep into the um, uh, weeds on this because it can become just overwhelming to pay attention. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there uh, can be re-entry. So we actually have the um, impulse that's coming down through those beautiful pathways, gets to sort of our AV node, but rather than building up steam and whooshing through those ventricles, instead that impulse actually uh, re-enters, goes back up into the atria. 
So there's a there's some uh, phenomena, particular cardiac phenomena. And if you work in cardiology, if you work in ICU, uh, all kinds of places, you'll learn much more about this. There's uh, particular syndromes where you have what's called re-entry, so that instead of moving fully through the entire conduction uh, system, that electrical impulse moves down through the atria, gets to the around the AV node, and then whooshes right back up to the atria. So not effective, and you get into a very tacky rhythm uh, that is um, brought about because of this constant re-entry, circular re-entry. So let's talk about uh, premature beats. Premature beats can happen anywhere. So they can happen in the atria, right? Those, the, the, typically in that left atria, or sorry, the right atria. They can happen at that AV junction, or they can happen through the ventricle. So anywhere along that conduction pathway, we can have these premature beats where somewhere along the conduction pathway, a, 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 um, a beat is a, a depolarization is initiated prematurely, ahead of when you expect the next beat to happen. So that's really what's, what is the characteristics. They appear early, so they appear before you would expect the next beat to happen. And there's a really important differentiation here because sometimes we see um, escape beats or we see uh, rescue beats, and those are uh, beats that happen late. So you've missed the window where your next beat should come and someone else in the system, somewhere else in the system saves you, you know, starts, it, it starts to beat because that's that redundancy we've talked about. In premature beats, it's not. You've got an, a, an underlying normal rhythm, and before the rhythm has a chance to move through its entire depolarization, repolarization, and begin again, another part of that uh, conduction system initiates a beat. Um, and so we call them, we identify them based on their location. So we have premature atrial complexes, PACs, and that's typically you'll just hear them called PACs, um, and there's an irritable focus somewhere within the atria. And that irritable focus discharges. So it begins its next uh, depolarization before the SA node impulse is ready to discharge, right? So the SA node is your major um, a pacemaker. It has moved through its process. It's depolarized. It's repolarizing. It's not yet ready for the next depolarization. And somewhere else in the atria uh, jumps in. Some other point in the atria jumps in and depolarizes and moves that process through. And that interrupts your normal sinus rhythm for a moment. Um, if the irritable site, the place that uh, you're seeing that a second beat come from, that premature beat come from, is close to the SA node, then um, the P wave will look quite similar. Because you remember, when we look at those um, upward and downward deflections, it's, um, it's like sort of looking at a map of that electrical discharge along a highway. And so if it's like a second car, a first car is along a pathway and we see that pathway forming. A second car comes and if it starts almost at the same place, it looks the same. The pathway, the map looks the same. But if the P wave comes from a very different spot, the map, which is our tracing, will look quite different. So the P wave could be peaked, the P wave could be um, flattened, it could... Uh, it just can look very different than the original P wave. And so looking at the what's called the morphology, the shape of your uh, different waves, helps you to understand if they're all coming from the same place. Do they look uniform or do they look different? Uh, sometimes notched, sometimes pointed, a whole bunch of things for a P wave that's coming from, that's a PAC. Uh, we see the same thing with a junctional. So that's at the AV junction. Premature junctional complexes can jump in or premature ventricular complexes, PVCs. Uh, we can see. So let's get back to our PACs, premature atrial complexes. How do you recognize them? So the rate typically when we're seeing PACs is within normal limits and normal limits is uh, defined by age, right? So if we're looking at children, normal limits are much higher. If we're looking at adults, we're saying 60 to 100 now, but I keep uh, reminding you that we're expecting in the next five or 10 years that there may be some real discussion about is normal 50 to 90 or even 50 to 100. So that may change. You never know, um, but we'll see. Uh, P so PACs at this point, we're saying the rate is uh, typically within normal limits, and that could be uh, 60 to 100, but some, uh, all things being equal, they don't have to only come when we see a, a normal uh, sinus rhythm or a, a rhythm between 60 and 100, but most often that's when we see it. And what we see with PACs is that the underlying rhythm is a normal rhythm, so we've got a regular rhythm. And then we've got these premature beats. So these beats that are jumping in early. And remember I said, if we have beats that are coming in late, they may be escape beats. 
um, or rescue beets, but if they're coming in early, they're those uh, premature beets, which is what we're, we're focusing on now. So a normal rhythm that is regular, and then we see these beets that come in early. So let's look at that a little bit more. Here's this um, uh, picture, and I showed this in class. So we see that the, the little uh, purple boxes on the diagram that say that have an S on them are uh, beats that are coming from the SA node, that normal underlying rhythm. And then we see here uh, a number of premature atrial beats. And so let's look at this. How would I figure this out? Would I just look at this rhythm and say this is an uh, irregular rhythm? Because it certainly is it not, when I look at all those beats, they're not all the same. Or would I be able to differentiate and say I've got an underlying regular rhythm with these beats that are coming in early? So how do I do that? Well, if you use your calipers or if you use your piece of paper, you're going to do the P to P and R to R. Now, if I did it across all of them, I'd say, wait a second, they're not all the same. And so I'm going to say before I give up and just say this is an irregular rhythm like I would see in atrial fib, and we'll talk about that later. I'm gonna take my piece of paper with the little notches I've drawn on them or my calipers, and I'm gonna say, do I see a pattern, right? Is there a, a pattern that is most consistent with some anomalies? And that's where I get to the point of saying, yes, I see over here, like beat, uh, the third beat, third beat, fourth beat, fifth beat, sixth beat, those are all regular. If I measure them, they're the same. And even if I move down uh, to the um, uh, seventh and eighth beat, the same, the same. So, and they all look the same. P's are all upright. They all look the same in terms of their morphology. QRS all look the same in terms of their morphology. And so I would be able to say there's some beats that are ir coming in at an irregular time. And that irregular time is premature. They're coming in ahead of when they should be coming in. All right, so earlier than they would be expected. And you remember, this is from the atrius. We said the P waves should be typically upright, so they should be at, uh, above that isoelectric line and, uh, and an upright um, loop, and there should be one P wave in front of each QRS. This isn't like atrial fibrillation where we see a lot of different uh, things going on there. We have one P wave in front of one QRS throughout the entire tracing, and those uh, P waves are followed by a QRS, and those beats consistently come in early. So they are coming in ahead of when you would expect um, uh, to see your, uh, the next uh, beat with your underlying rhythm. And again, here we can see that these P waves for the ones that are the smiling faces are notched. So you see those big, the, the P waves for the um, uh, PACs are different than the P waves we see in our underlying normal rhythm. Okay, so what causes um, PACs? Lots of things. They're common, common, common. I bet all of you have probably had a PAC at one time or another, or every, for sure people you know have. It really doesn't say that there's some underlying cardiac disease. It's not something that we are terribly concerned about. Like everything else, we pay attention to it. But um, they can occur because of a lot of things, emotional stress, high stress moments where you may have a lot of adrenaline surging through your system. Uh, you can have it when you have um, uh, mental or physical fatigue. What we know now is that sleep is so fundamental to health and so many of us are deprived of sleep. When we talk about, currently there's a lot of evidence that really focuses on the obesity epidemic, which is very serious. Now I think the next 10 years are going to fo focus on sleep deprivation and the epidemic in particular in North America around sleep deprivation and how that affects us uh, mentally and physically, right? But there are also physiological things that can cause this. So things like congestive heart failure, can, you'll see congestive heart failure through many of these phenomena today. When we have acute coronary syndromes, and you know that's when you can have MI or um, heart injury, so with a variety of acute coronary syndromes. When we have um, uh, anomalies associated with our atria that are causing enlargement or other things, so that, imagine that would be affecting the automaticity within that um, electrical system. Uh, when uh, digitalis, so digoxin, we give digoxin less often than we did, but it's still a workhorse within our pharmaceutical um, repertoire. So um, uh, levels of digoxin, when they are, become high, we have a lot of that altered automaticity that happens. Electrolytes, really, whenever we see any kind of anomalies on our ECGs, we want to do a full set of electrolytes, uh, um, uh, sodium, potassium, chloride, bicarb, we want to be doing calcium and magnesium for sure. And we may do many other things, but those for sure. Uh, thyroid, 
when we have hyperthyroid, that can cause that altered automaticity. And really what we need to pay attention to are those kinds of stimulants that are both legal and illegal. So uh, things like caffeine, and I, I think I re revealed in class too much of myself the other day when I said I, I easily have four coffees a day. Um, uh, tobacco is another one. The nicotine uh, in um, uh, cigarettes is very difficult, uh, very um, likely to cause PACs. And what we know now with the new phenomena of vaping is that often there is not a restriction in the same way, and there may be much higher levels of those, uh, those drugs that can cause these PACs. And also um, some illicit drugs like cocaine in particular. Cocaine is a very bad culprit for causing PACs. Okay, what do you do? So if it's you or me or somebody else with a normal healthy heart and you have the occasional PAC, it's not really important. Blood pressure is stable. Everything else is fine. Um, we may not do anything except talk about um, how do we modify lifestyle and other things, right? So how do we um, remove the underlying cause? So if it's lack of sleep, if it's um, uh, um, alterations in your um, mental health in terms of your levels of stress and other things, we want to really work on those. If PACs are frequent, sometimes people will feel that little butterfly feeling that um, <coughs> uh, feel like you're skipping a beat and other kinds of things. The one thing I want to pay attention to in terms of our assessment of patients is whenever we have an irregular heartbeat, even if it's just the occasional PAC, we always um, count, if we're doing a, a pulse, we always count it for a full minute, right? Because we want to make sure that we're accurate. So if they're not on a cardiac monitor, we want to count their heart rate for a full minute to make sure that we've accounted for uh, the irregularity. Uh, so again, PACs, if they're occasional, we really don't have to treat them. Uh, and it, it's sort of something that if it's not doing any harm, you don't want to try to fix something and make a bigger problem. Um, it, they typically, uh, up to 50% of uh, people can have PACs and most are completely asymptomatic. But frequent PACs, so if you have a lot of PACs, they can initiate more lethal rhythms. And those can include, in particular, atrial fibrillation. We're going to talk about that later. Atrial flutter. We're going to talk about that later. And paroxysmal SVT, uh, supraventricular tachycardia. We're going to talk about that later. So PACs become a problem when we see more of them. One single PAC is unlikely to lead to another kind of uh, more lethal rhythm. But multiple PACs tell us about that altered automaticity uh, within our heart. Uh, conduction pathways, and that is the, the risk then, is that we're going to move to a very aberrant um, uh, um, conduction problem. So um, frequent PACs, we might help somebody to go to a stress reduction program, uh, talk to them about uh, lifestyle choices such as caffeine-containing beverages. That would be really catastrophic for me. Uh, we would treat underlying conditions that we know about, uh, congestive heart failure, things like that. Electrolytes for sure, right? We're going to look at those electrolytes and make sure everything's okay. If needed, if someone has a lot of PACs and if needed, uh, and we're looking to medications to treat them, we may look at beta blockers. And we're going to see this with a lot of those sort of uh, rapid rhythms. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and or sometimes anti-anxiety medications to help somebody um, with the level of... Um, uh, anxiety that they're experiencing and the, in, the physiological impacts of that. Okay, let's move on. Atrial tachycardia. Um, eat, so just as you can imagine, we talked about um, a sinus tachycardia, which was a, a rhythm greater than 100 and up typically to a maximum of 180, but rarely would you see an atrial tachycardia or a sinus tachycardia above 150. Um, it, not that often at all. But an atrial tachycardia can go much more quickly. An atrial tachycardia can go from 100 to 250. So that is, you imagine how fast that rhythm is. So it's a series of beats that happened. You, you have a PAC, remember we talked just about PACs, premature atrial contraction. But this premature atrial contra contraction typically then leads to um, a, a rhythm that is uh, fast and coming from an altered site, right? So a couple of uh, uh, so uh, a series of beats from an irritable site in that atria, uh, often uh, precipitated by that PAC, and it overrides the SA node. The SA node with its natural rate that is much slower, you know, 50 to 100, 60 to 100, uh, and this irritable site becomes the pacemaker. So it's not that rhythm, the rhythm is coming from all over the atria, there's one irritable site, it jumps in at a very elevated rate, and it, it takes over, it becomes the lead but it is um, aberrant because it is so fast. And so the conduction from that site to the ventricles is one-to-one, -one, so it doesn't mean that we have a whole bunch of uh, different sites that are all trying to compete with each other. There's one leader 
one irritable site that becomes the leader and that moves down very quickly to the ventricles. And so that means that um, every atrial um, impulse is conducted down to the ventricles. And so that's a so then the ventricles are contracting at a very high rate. And that's why we actually feel that very high pulse and we, uh, and we can see um, uh, systemic uh, problems from that, drop in blood pressure and other things, as cardiac output is impacted by that very, very rapid pulse. The other thing that's impacted is the oxygen demand of your heart. And so remember, we've talked about that, that the, uh, that the heart um, spends 95% of its time in service of the body, constantly pumping so that we have that good cardiac output and we're able to um, move that blood around, that oxygenated blood around our body, bring back the deoxygenated blood uh, to go through that whole process. But the heart needs to nourish itself as well. And those coronary arteries that come right off our circulation um, actually get there, uh, have the opportunity to have that process where their oxygenated blood is transferred into the cells through the capillary membranes through in that moment of diastole, in the moment of rest. So when the heart is contracted tight, it's very hard for that to happen. That, that, ox that oxygen transfer into the heart cell happens through those cellular membranes um, when uh, the capillary membranes, when the heart is in diastole. If your heart rate is 200 beats per minute, there's very little diastole. So two things that are working in combination in a very difficult way. Um, that her, your heart is beating very fast, so because it's working so hard, it needs more oxygen. It's also beating so fast that it has very limited time for the, um, that cellular uh, process to happen in which the oxygen is able to move beyond the capillary membrane. So two things working against you, and that can become the problem, is that, it, that the strain on your heart can be very significant in terms of its own myocardial oxygen demand. So atrial tachycardia, uh, consists of a series of rapid beats from that irritable site, right? Remember, irritable site starts and rapid, and there has to be more than three. So more than three of those rapid beats coming from the same site. So here we say more than three of what those, it comes in prematurely, create those pre PACs, they come back to back to back, at least three. And what we call uh, paroxysmal atrial tachycardia is atrial tachycardia that starts or stops and, uh, very quickly. So when it starts or stops suddenly, we call it paroxysmal, starts or stops suddenly. Um, and again, so that, that irritable site overrides the SA node as the pacemaker. It becomes the um, uh, pacemaker site, and it's a rapid a rhythm at greater than 100 beats per minute. So how do, what does that look like on uh, tracing? So here we see on the right-hand side of our tracing a sinus rhythm. So our normal sinus rhythm, we've got a, a P, Q, R, S, T, and all within normal limits. The atrial tachycardia, we see, let's, before I, you know, we've talked already about rate, 100 to 250. The rhythm in this atrial tachycardia is regular because, remember, it's not um, electrical impulses from all over the atria. It's electrical impulses from one site. So one site becomes the pacemaker, so it's a regular rhythm because it's one site that has moved to this uh, rhythm, uh, to taking over the lead. So it's a regular rhythm, but it is a, a fast rhythm that has taken over for sinus. So if we look here at the atrial tachycardia, we see that the rate is rapid, but we've got one positive P wave preceding each QRS complex. We don't have like an atrial fibrillation, a whole bunch of different messy stuff there. We don't have extra P waves all over the place. We have one P wave preceding each QRS. The P waves are all upright typically. They look a little bit different most often than the P waves that are in our normal sinus rhythm. And here you can see that these ones are slightly larger. And you remember they look normal, we talked about morphology. They look uh, different because they're coming from a different site. So it's like that map, the, the map, the pathway that they came on show, uh, shows up in the morphology or the shape. And uh, between each of those beats, we go back to that isoelectric line. So what do you do about it? Uh, it's funny because sometimes depending again on how fast that rhythm is, um, uh, patients may be completely asymptomatic as they go through a little burst of atrial tachycardia and it resolves. Some patients may complain of that sudden feeling of palpitations, uh, difficulty breathing, lightheadedness. Some people may have that chest pressure. Remember, that's when we're having myocardial oxygen demand that may not be met with that process I talked about. 
it's important to ask patients when they're feeling that fluttering sensation in their chest or that those palpitations, are they regular or irregular? We're going to ask them how that feels. We're going to also feel and make sure that is the case. And um, irregular uh, palpitations may be from something else. Um, sometimes patients who go into atrial tachycardia may, may present with syncope. So this episode has actually led to a decrease in cardiac output and, um, and, and uh, loss of consciousness, right? So fainting, which is uh, adaptive. Your body wants to get you to the ground so that it's not having to, to try to provide oxygen to your brain against gravity. Um, and usually that syncope happens sort of right at the beginning, right at the beginning of the burst of that atrial tachycardia as there's, as there's a sudden change in cardiac activity. Uh, output for your body. Um, some people who have a lot of atrial tachycardia or who are predisposed to it may experience when they go into these bouts of atrial tachycardia, particularly, you would, it wouldn't happen if you had it for a couple of uh, seconds, uh, once in a while, but if, if you have uh, fairly frequent bouts of atrial tachycardia, you may find that there's associated uh, congestive heart failure because, again, that um, alteration in your good cardiac output. Um, you may also experience angina. Remember, we talked about that inability of your heart to get enough of its own oxygen through that period at the same time as its workload is increasing. So we may see that uh, as well as shortness of breath. So I know you guys are going to know OMI if you need to, right? Oxygen monitor intravenous. Um, uh, typically, atrial tachycardia is something that we can manage very effectively, but we need to be cautious. So what do we do about it? If it lasts just like three, four, five beats, um, or even up to 30 seconds, we call that non-sustained. And a sustained rhythm lasts more than 30 seconds. So a sustained atrial tachycardia is lasting more than 30 seconds. So if the atrial tachycardia is sustained and the patient is symptomatic because of that rapid rate, we may try to do a couple of things. And I showed this in class, vagal maneuvers. And remember, nurses do not do vagal maneuvers, right? Nurses don't typically do not do those vagal maneuvers, uh, although you may be part of supporting that process. And that um, helps the patient uh, although, I, uh, you know what, let me just, um, let me retract that. Nurses don't do Valsalva. We are involved in some other vagal maneuvers, but typically uh, only with support, uh, unless you're working in a very specific cardiac ICU. Uh, vagal maneuvers include a range of things. So one was that carotid massage. We talked about that right at the angle of the jaw, and you do that. Nurses do not do carotid massage. Physicians do it. The risk is when you have an older patient um, that they, you may dislodge plaque right? Because you're really massaging for 10 to 15 seconds there and maybe even 20 seconds, that carotid sinus. <coughs> in doing that, you may have plaque buildup in there and you're uh, releasing that so you can have a stroke or an MI or other kinds of things with that little clot moving around. So you have to be careful. Uh, carotid massage is often very effective for patients, uh, young patients. You would most often find that much more effective in the um, ER when you see a patient in the ER in an urgent care clinic with that uh, sudden onset of atrial tachycardia versus in the ICU where you're, a patient's gonna likely be medicated or do other things. We also have other vagal maneuvers. One is that bearing down as if you're going to have a bowel movement that increases that intrathoracic and intra-abdominal pressure uh, and has that same effect that that vagal, um, that vagus nerve is uh, stimulated and that uh, in, we have input from our parasympathetic system which is the slow down system. Um, you can also do this uh, maneuver where you uh, put your put a patient's face in icy, icy cold water for a couple of seconds, and at the same time, often put an ice pack on the back of their neck. I have never seen that in my life. Uh, I asked Leslie about it the other day. She said in the '70s she saw it, old fashioned, but it's still there. It's still legitimate. There's lots of places I might be. And if you think that calls upon a sort of a, a human reflex for drowning, that in cases of drowning we want to shut our body down, sort of almost go into a fake hibernation, and that's what that does. Um, there's other ones where you can actually lie a patient flat and have them do those kind of vagal movements. That uh, pushing, straining, uh, inc increasing your intra-thoracic uh, pressure. Um, if we find that those, and we would always try, and so cer certainly in the ER, we would try some of those vagal maneuvers. If you walked in into a patient's room and you're in the ICU and they went into a, uh, an atrial tachycardia, uh, there would be typically, now again, all, all things being equal, other thing, patient being stable in other ways, typically that would be fine to, ha to have them try to bear down while you're thinking what are the next steps. Um, to see if the vagal maneuver is successful or not. If that not successful and we're moving to uh, medications, right, then we would look to antiarrhythmic medications like adenosine. That's our drug of choice. And we're going to see adenosine for a couple of other rhythms today as well. Uh, unless a patient has severe asthma, this is an important caution. If a patient has severe asthma, we do not want to give that adenosine. Um, 
However, we could also look at some other kinds of medications. Uh, calcium channel blockers, we remember we talked about that already, Cal for, uh, calcium channel blockers for a lot of, if we had a fair number of PACs, beta blockers, which are going to bring our heart rate down, um, and uh, amiodarone, which will help to slow the ventricular rate in response to that. Um, if you have poor ventricular function, so your ventricular function, your heart has a real difficulty in terms of that contractility of your heart and, and managing cardiac output because of that, amiodarone is the drug that we're going to pay attention to. Um, uh, there were some trials, they've looked at cardioversion for atrial tachycardia, typically not successful, uh, but you may have to use it if these drugs are not effective. Okay, now, oh, supraventricular arrhythmias. So we, we've been talking about arrhythmias that are coming from the atria. Now we want to talk about um, rhythms that come up where we are um, not just in the atria, but abo anywhere above the ventricle. So they can be from the SA node, they can be uh, from the atrial tissue, but when we're talking supraventricular, we're talking usually about um, rhythms that start right above the bifurc bifurcation of the bundle of hiss. So you remember you have that, uh, you come down from your SA node through your pathways to your AV node, you stop, gather up steam just for a millisecond, and then whoosh down. You, when you whoosh down, you come through right immediately below the AV node, you have that bundle of hiss and then that bifurcates, right, into your left and right bundle branches. So bundle of hiss bifurcates or splits into the bundle branches and then we come all the way around the ventricles and we have our Purkinje fibers. So right up there below the AV node, we have that bundle of hiss where it is one pathway just before it breaks off into one on the right, side, right ventricle and one on the left ventricle, which are the bundle branches. So supraventricular arrhythmias are above, just above the ventricle, uh, just or just at the very tip there, and they are uh, above the bifurcation, right? So above where we bifurcate into left and right bundle branches. Um, and so that can include rhythms that begin in all those places. Um, let's talk about uh, paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. Such an interesting uh, rhythm. So it's regular. It's a narrow QRS tachycardia, and it starts or ends suddenly. And because this is uh, narrow and, and quite fast, the P waves of the uh, um, uh, complexes we're looking at are often hidden in the T waves of the preceding beats. So the P waves and the T waves um, sort of merge into one or we don't see that. And so if you look at these beats, we've got a normal sinus rhythm to start for our first three beats. And then we start with this, remember paroxysmal starts or stops suddenly, uh, this sudden onset of a rhythm where we see this sort of peaked, peaked-ish P wave, but really what we've got is where the T wave would be coming in and then it continues to go up as the P wave is buried in that T wave. And, the, and that happens for all of these beats in a row, in a row. let's see how many we have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then there, do you notice there's a little bit of a gap and we move back into what will be our not normal silence rhythm. So it's not unusual to see it's a rapid beat. It's that, that narrow QRS. Uh, so it, because it's, it's not starting in the ventricles, it's starting up above that uh, bifurcation in the, uh, into the uh, bundle branches. Yikes. Um, I'm going to move down. Sorry, 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 sorry. Thanks. Oh, I want to talk about that a little bit more. Um, and I don't have anything more to say on this slide. So I'm going to, let me just talk to you a little bit more about uh, 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 paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. We manage it uh, with the use of medications typically. So you can do all of those things that we do to try to get that uh, vagus nerve to work, right? So we can do uh, vagal maneuvers, we can um, have that person try to bear down, we can do carotid sinus massage, all of those things. If um, they are unsuccessful, the drug of choice for paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia that is sustained, so we have a little run here, but it's not um, persistent. If it is sustained, that, and the person has, um, and it's a, it, it's a rapid rhythm, then we would use adenosine. We talked about that in class before, adenosine is a medication that we're gonna be giving very rapidly. When we give adenosine, we want to make sure that we are not um, 
uh, that the patient doesn't have severe asthma. The adenosine has to be given push and followed by uh, a, another syringe of saline that's given immediately behind the adenosine. So we're pushing that in as quickly as possible. Often we have our, our hand just on the patient, maybe on their chest or on their arm. Uh, patients may jump or feel a funny, that sort of sudden feeling of doom. Often at the end of giving adenosine, as soon as we've given the adenosine, we see a gap uh, that looks like a flat line for a, a couple of seconds, like we're missing several beats. Sometimes that can feel uh, a little bit unnerving, but I have never seen adenosine not then uh, have convert into some kind of rhythm. And so it just, you, you just have to be prepared for, to see that. And then usually we move back into that sinus rhythm. Okay, now let's look at atrial flutter. Atrial flutter is an interesting rhythm, and I think I asked you guys in class and you said you hadn't really learned too much about it. So we'll talk about it for a minute. A minute. Atrial uh, flutter, it's an ectopic atrial rhythm, and it's from irritable sites in the atria, and it again is a, a regular rhythm, right? We're gonna talk about atrial fibrillation and it's shortly, and that's an irregular rhythm. But atrial flutter is a regular rhythm um, in which the atria are hyperexcitable in an interesting way. So atrial flutter, flutter is a really fast atrial rate, and it results in waveforms that look below here like this. Just notice we call those sauty, or sometimes some people call it a picket fence. It looks like a picket fence in front of your house, but really most often you'll hear that sawtooth uh, wave pattern, right? And those waves between, you see the QRS complexes, but between them we see that flood, the, those flutters. Those are called flutter waves. So how would you recognize atrial flutter? Um, it's important to recognize that when we are doing uh, our conduction, our, our regular process for conduction, we look at um, both our QRSs. So in this case, if we did QRS, uh, R to R to R to R to R, it's all regular. In the bottom one, we see R to R to R to R, it's all regular. But the number of flutter waves is different. So we have a different conduction rate. So what happens with atrial flutter is that not every beat is conducted down through the ventricles, as opposed to other rapid rates we've talked about today, where every P wave is conducted down and, and begins a QRS, a depolarization. So for every initiation of an impulse, we actually have a heart uh, contraction. For atrial flutter, not every um, atrial, con atrial depolarization gets conducted through to the ventricles. And that's really important because then our ventricular rate might be quite normal while we've got this rapid atrial rate. Um, and so if you look at the top one here, we see this atrial, uh, what's called a two to one conduction. And you can't, it's really important to recognize that you can't just count them. What you have to look at, and it's often hard when you have a two to one, what you have to look at is the rate between the P waves and the rate between the QRS. The, I'm, I'm not gonna ever give you a two to one because I think that's a little bit hard to figure out because P waves are buried in T waves and you see there's some ups and downs here. Uh, so hard to determine. If you look at these little arrows, do you see the arrow? You've got a downward deflected P wave. After the QRS, what you might think would be coming back up to a, a T wave, it's actually another P wave that's a downward deflected. The next one is a downward deflected before the QRS. The next P wave is the downward deflected above it. It's very hard to read that. But let's look down at, the, at number B. Uh, B is a four to one conduction rate. Now, if I tried to count them, I'd say maybe I had a QRS, followed by that rounded T, and then one, two Ps, and then a QRS, but, and, but I'd be wrong. What I have to actually do is calculate my ventricular rate, and you remember you did that with your um, counting, you could use your counting method, you could use the big box method, the little box method. I typically count the 300, 100, 150. So let's say I started with one, two, three, the fourth beat. It's pretty much on that solid line. So I would count in the big box method for me, uh, the counting method, 300, 150, 100, 75, 60. It's between 60 and 50. And then I would say it's about 55. The rate for my ventricles, and I would have already used either my calipers or my paper to see that this is a regular rate. I can't use that method unless I have a regular rhythm, uh, is about 55. But now I want to figure out what is my atrial rate. And I would do it from two, uh, from one P wave to the next P wave. And if I use that same method, you see, let me, I'm gonna go over to, uh, if I count the arrows from the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six, about the sixth P wave. And these are downward deflected P waves, right? They're flipped P waves. And remember that just tells us it's coming from a different place in the atria. And if it's flipped 
if it's um, upside down, it's right uh, close to the AV node probably. So I would look at that seventh arrow and the eighth arrow. And I would do my um, uh, calculations again. I would do, I can do my calc. So 300, 150, now it's between 150 and 300. And I have uh, five different, uh, five little boxes. So each one is, is 30. Each one of those little boxes would be 30. So I would have um, 300, 150. So it would be like two, my atria would be at 270. Yikes! My atria is at 270. Uh, I think I'm doing this wrong. 300, 150, no. One, oh, one, sorry. Each one is, uh, sorry. 150 and each one of these is 30. So 150 and four, oh, yeah, I think it's one, 150, yep. So there I have it uh, at uh, 270. Crazy, right? Um, and so then I would compare my atrial rate and my ventricular rate. And in comparing my atrial rate and my ventricular rate, I do that comparison. And this gives me a four to one, although that was a little bit of a messy calculation for me. Uh, so if I have my ventricular rate roughly at 60, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, roughly at 60 and my ventricular rate uh, roughly I got about 270 but I guess they're saying or about maybe it's between those two so um, 255 so I've got 60 and 255 it's about a four to one conduction rate so for every four P waves uh, one impulse is conducted through that ventricle so I did an example of such a messy calculation there for you and I apologize we'll practice some in class as well uh, and it will be a little bit easier to see them. We'll make sure we've got examples, although this one isn't a hard one to see. It's just uh, quite fast. So how do you recognize it? We don't have P, like P waves in, per se. What we have are these sawtooth flutter waves, and we are actually measuring that. The PR interval, we can't measure a PR interval because from which, which sawtooth, we don't have a normal P wave, and which sawtooth do we start at, like the first and second, because they're not all conducted through. So we don't, when we're talking, when we're measuring for an atrial flutter, we don't have a measurable PR interval. The QRS is less than uh, 0.10 or 0.11 or 0.12. I'm never going to get you on that. So different references might say 0.10 or 0.11, 0.12. You get it. It's normal. It's within normal limits, the QRS typically. But if you end up with these flutter waves buried in everything, often those flutter waves are buried in your T wave for sure, but sometimes they actually even get buried in a QRS it may look anomalous. Um, it may look anomalous. So just to be aware of that. What causes it? Usually, do you remember we talked about PACs are mostly harmless, but then sometimes a PAC can um, precipitate other kinds of rhythm, rhythms. And this is one of the things that it can precipitate. You have that PAC, premature atrial complex. It comes in early, it jumps in, and by itself it's fairly harmless, but it leads to this funny rhythm, this uh, automaticity that's happening from one place um, and the automaticity is making a very fast uh, co um, conduction through the atria, but not all of those, uh, um, not all of that depolarization is conducted then down through into the ventricles. So um, it often can just last a couple of seconds. It can last uh, half an hour or an hour. It's a kind of a, a rhythm that you often see only in the ER or in the ICU. It rarely lasts more than 24 hours. Rarely, rarely, and even that long is very long. Um, atrial flutter usually self-converts. If you were at home and you had palpitations but you didn't know what they were and you didn't seek treatment, it self-converts to uh, usually uh, either it goes back to a sinus rhythm or it's going to go move on to atrial fibrillation, which can be much more chronic. So what causes atrial flutter? Um, so again, it can be a really important underlying cardiac conditions. Lack of oxygen is a really important one. We always pay attention. Do you remember we've talked about um, making sure our patients are oxygenated appropriately? Uh, uh, things like a pulmonary embolism or pericarditis where we have inflammation around our heart can make that um, a heart very irritable. Those, um, the cells in our conduction system very irritable. We also see with, um, some pneumonias that there's a much more likelihood that we can go into it. So we might otherwise have a healthy, healthy-ish heart, uh, but we can go into atrial flutter. 
uh, MI. So MIs are going to give us lots of different kinds of arrhythmias, and that's be or dysrhythmias. That's because um, there's a damage to parts of our heart and parts of conduction pathways, and those cells become very irritable. Um, we talked about digoxin before. Digoxin, which we are giving a little bit less, but when we have high levels of digitalis, we can see that irritability. And also another drug, quinidine or quinidine-associated drugs, um, if the levels are too high, we can see that as well. If we have patients who have open heart surgery, we would watch for atrial flutter, maybe a consequence of that, and we'd pay attention to it. Um, and hyperthyroidism. So hyperthyroidism, anything that's sort of revving up our system. So uh, what do you do about it? It really depends on um, a whole bunch of things. One is that rate. Remember I said not every um, depolarization is conducted through to the ventricle. And that's kind of a, a way, um, we have what's called a, like a refractory period. So our ventricles do not want to be uh, conducting impulses at 200 beats per minute, right? They don't want to be. That's not healthy. That's not helpful for our heart. That doesn't typically give us a good cardiac output. Um, so there's a refractory period that enables those that conduction to come down to the AV node, but not to be conducted all the way through. And that's what happens in flutter. It's it, there is this consistent atrial depolarization, but only a regular number of them, one in two, one in four, three, one in four, a regular number of them are conducted down through the ventricles. If that ventricular rate is steady, so you may have this atrial flutter at a very high rate, but your ventricular rate is steady, um, then we would be we would look at a little bit more of a conservative treatment. It, we would also look at how long you have been in atrial flutter and also your underlying cardiovascular status. So how stable are you in other ways, right? So again, those vagal maneuvers, we can help. Uh, sometimes those vagal maneuvers are helpful, not because they get you out of atrial flutter, but you may think that someone's in atrial flutter and it may, remember in these rapid rhythms, it's a little bit hard. You see me, I was trying to calculate, uh, looking at the screen there um, and having a little bit of a difficult time even calculating rate myself. Those vagal maneuvers sometimes can help to slow down the heart rate enough so that you can actually differentiate what is the under, what actually is the rhythm here that's going on. If there is a rapid ventricular rate, right? So let's say we have a two to one conduction and the, and the ventricular response is a rapid rate above 100 and not just 110. So we have a, 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 a tachycardia associated with this. We want to slow down that ventricular response. And that can be um, uh, important and we can do that with medications. So again, we can do that with those medications, those beta blockers and other things. But we want to really make sure that the patient is stable if that's where we're going. If the patient is in this um, um, atrial flutter, they are not stable, so their blood pressure is compromised because of that rapid ventricular response, we are typically going to move to the, uh, the implementation of an electrical therapy, right, use of electricity, and it's really important that we are doing what's called synchronized cardioversion. It's not like when someone has an, uh, an MI and uh, we're just zapping them. We are doing a synchronized cardioversion, and we're going to show you that in class. I think on the last day of class, just to have an opportunity to actually try that yourself, uh, you may you need to make sure that it's synced, the, the machine is synced, so that you are giving the impulse at the right time so that we don't create further problems. So uh, if a rapid ventricular response from this atrial flutter and the patient is compromised, we actually move to application of electricity and do a synchronized cardioversion. Okay, now atrial fibrillation. Everybody knows all about this. You guys are the experts. Um, we have, again, automaticity, right? That irritable cells and that alteration in automaticity from a lot of uh, causes can um, lead us to have that impulses that are being generated all over that atria. Those irritable sites, now we don't have a ventricular response of 400 to 600 times a minute, but those irritable sites can be, um, all, they're all over the atria and we can see that firing rate of 400 to 600 times a minute, which is crazy. Imagine all that firing all over our atria. And so that causes the atria to not be able to have that uniform contraction, but rather it fibrillates, right? So it quivers or fibrillates. So what are the consequences of that? One, we have very ineffectual atrial contraction. Now we know luckily, it's sort of that redundancy, how miraculous, that the ventricle will fill passively anyway. So 70% of the blood that goes into our ventricles is just filling passively. But when we don't have that uh, effective atrial contraction, we don't have that atrial kick, that 30 per, last 30% of blood volume that goes into the ventricles from that good atrial contraction. So because of that, we lose our stroke volume, the amount of blood that we're ejecting with each contraction of our heart, 
uh, it decreases our stroke volume, and because we decrease our stroke volume, we decrease that critical indicator, our cardiac output. And it's our cardiac output that keeps us safe and alive, right? And, and that's all associated with that loss of atrial kick. So how do you recognize it? I know you know this. Do you see, uh, we're looking for a P wave. We don't see any P waves. So no, P, no recognizable P wave. We see all that junk. We have, uh, when we try to measure a PR interval, we've got no P wave, so there's no PR interval. When we look at QRS, it's typically narrow. Again, less than 0 0.12, 0 0.11, 0 0.10, all the, re all the references that say any of those numbers are fine. But it's a normal width. The only thing that we caution, just as an atrial flutter, is that sometime there can be some conduction delays or other things that make for a wider QRS. And I'm not going to talk about them in this course. It's too much. Um, but I just want you to bury this word, uh, like if you have what's called a bundle branch blocks or a conduction delay down further in the ventricles, you can have a wider rhythm that is not relate that it still is an atrial fibrillation. It's just that there's a conduction delay later. You don't need to know that for now, but I'm just saying it because later you'll read it and be thinking, what did you miss all along? You missed nothing. That's finesse. You don't need that level of finesse. Atrial fibrillation. In this course, what you're going to see on the NCLEX, what you're going to see early in your career, most of what you're going to see is the junk on the line. That isoelectric line is not nice and smooth. We see that fibrillation happening. Um, as um, indicated by that electrical activity that's so random all over the place. We do not have a recognizable P wave, so we do not have a recognizable PR interval, and our QRS uh, is typically uh, normal in width, so less than 0 0.12, 0 0.11, 0 0.10, whichever measure you want to use. So what causes it? Uh, lots of times heart disease. So it can, it can occur in patients uh, with a known heart disease, it is one of the most common dysrhythmias that we see, and so there's a lot of care that goes into treating it, uh, but we can also see it sometimes in people who have absolutely no uh, cardiac disease. Sometimes it even occurs in young people under 60, and um, there's not really any evidence of cardiac disease. We often call that low atrial fibrillation, which means we have atrial fibrillation in the absence of any other symptoms in our heart that would indicate uh, what, are the, what is the risk factor for this, what's causing this. Uh, why do we worry about it? First of all, you all know this. Oh my gosh, I know you know this. Stroke risk, right? We've got, because the atria is not contracting effectively, blood micro, it, so it's not like you've got big, huge clots of blood, but blood pools in the atria, right? Because, and then just, if, you know, as the atria are fibrillating, it will move in, but you've, you're forming these micro clots. And those micro clots then move into our circulation uh, and they can move into the arteries in our brain, which are very narrow and cause very uh, significant ischemic problems in our brain. Um, they also can lead to microclots in our cardiac system, so in our in our um, um, cardiac arteries, right? So our, uh, within the actual myocardium, can, we can end up with an oxygen deprivation as well. So in terms of atrial fibrillation, it can be caused um, by by sort of the uh, idiopathic, no known cause. Uh, lots of cardiac diseases can cause it. So ischemic heart disease, remember ischemia, lack of oxygen, hypertension. Uh, in, as we age, our body just runs down. It's a real sad fact of life. And as I age, I think of it for myself. But our body runs down. And one of the most common things we see in terms of that electric, that beautiful, redundant electrical system in our heart is that the wearing down in that system. So in it, it's very common in advanced age. Um, uh, there, Particularly in older populations, you may still see this, is rheumatic heart disease where their um, uh, patients would have rheumatic fever, particularly as children, and they would then experience um, um, injury and um, um, consequences to their heart valves, and because of that, it would lead to this. Um, congestive heart failure, uh, some things here, I'm not gonna ask you about them, some different syndromes, uh, again, that pericarditis, sort of an inflammation of the um, lining of our heart or, and the surrounding sac around our heart that causes that real increase in um, um, irritability of the cells in our conduction system. Uh, pulmonary embolism. Um, sometimes this happens after surgery, particularly at very common after cardiac surgery. So if you're working on a post-cardiac post surgery floor, you'll see that a lot. Um, stress, very common. Excessive caffeine. Um, hypoxia, and we talked about that already. Um, and when we're looking at electrolytes, calcium, right? Hypocalcemia. Oh, sorry, hypokalemia. 
Um, the other thing is that there's an association, so hypokalemia, I don't want to forget this, so low potassium. The other thing that there's an association with is diabetes. So we see a greater association of atrial fibrillation in patients with diabetes and when they have uh, periods of hypoglycemia, low blood sugar. Again, that thyroid, when we have a, a thyroid um, that is moving, that is um, overactive, and we have high levels of those thyroid hormones in our system that call that and our, our heart in particular responds to those. One of the associated tachyrhythms we see is that atrial fibrillation. The other rhythm, the, the other cause of this rhythm very commonly is electrocution. So when a patient is electrocuted, often what happens, we see that uh, real impact in, the, in that right atria. So what do you do about it? Again, it's sort of like we were just talking about atrial flutter. flutter. It's really important uh, to look at the ventricular rate. What is the ventricular rate? and how do we manage the ventricle? So we can't necessarily um, get somebody back into normal sinus rhythm, but boy, we would like to, and we're gonna try to. But in the meantime, we need to slow down that ventricular rate if the ventricles are firing too quickly, right? So we need to get, because that ventricular rate is what's gonna really impact our cardiac output and um, the oxygen demands of our heart and other kinds of things. So if there's a rapid ventricular rate, we're gonna control that ventricular response. Uh, and we're gonna do that with medications. Um, if there are serious signs uh, that a patient is compromised, so this is a new onset atrial fibrillation, let's say the person is tachycardic or other things, and they're compromised, and you guys would know what that be, they're compromised in what way? They may have decreased level of consciousness, they may have a low blood pressure, and uh, become what we would say is un unstable. And in particular now, there's some emerging evidence about the importance of really moving very quickly to what's called synchronized cardioversion. We talked about that in atrial flutter, that synchronizing when we're applying the electricity. But there's some real good evidence that if we see a patient come in in, a, an, in an atrial fibrillation that is a new onset atrial fibrillation, and we have a sense, we know that that atrial fibrillation <coughs> is new, and we know when it started. So it didn't start a week ago. But within 24 hours in particular, often if we can get cardiology there within the first, we can diagnose this within the first eight to 12 hours, uh, they may move to that more aggressive synchronized cardioversion as opposed to um, medication, use of medication, because we're much more likely to get them back into that normal sinus rhythm. If it's a new onset, just new onset, uh, much more likely to get them back into that uh, sinus rhythm as opposed to being uh, on medications lifelong. Uh, if they are, and the other times when we are going to move to synchronized cardioversion is when a patient is compromised, right? So it becomes, a, and it, when it's an emergent situation. Uh, otherwise, oh, sorry, look at that. I've lost my slide. So otherwise we might use um, uh, old standby digoxin. We would be looking at anticoagulating the patient. Uh, other kinds of cardiac medications may be second and, and third tier. And we're looking to see, uh, so antiarrhythmics, and looking to see how we can manage decreasing that automaticity in the atria and um, um, making sure that the ventricular response is at a rate that sustains a good blood pressure and a good cardiac output. Gosh, I hope that was helpful. And I will talk to you guys again soon.